you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, has become such an incredibly important part of the oil and gas industry, particularly at a time where we have low prices and enormous competition. Bringing down that marginal cost on a barrel of oil is absolutely critical for the survival of energy companies today. And I think uh, we've got a great panel here to talk about uh, how that's going to be possible. Uh, we've all met Paul, uh, but next to him is Yash, who, as said, is a partner with Carriage and Capital. Uh, they have over $2 billion under management, uh, most of it in the energy sector. Uh, their assets are all over the world, um, outside of North America, and they've made major investments in UK and Norway uh, recently. Uh, Yash has 22 years of experience in the energy and natural resources industries. Next to him is Ken Topolinsky, uh, who works for the Veritable Hunt Oil Company. If you're from Texas or know anything about the history of oil exploration, it is one of the uh, oldest and most uh, well-known uh, of the small, uh, smaller operators. Um, Ken has wor also worked all over the world in Algeria, Colombia, and Equatorial Guinea, Guinea as well as Canada. And then, of course, we have Gary Ingdahl from Cognite. He's the chief technology officer there. And um, he's been in this field for a long time. Uh, in 2011, he founded SnapScale Snap Sale, um, and served as CEO and CTO there until uh, Shipstead acquired it. And uh, before that, he spent three years as a software engineer for Google in Canada. And so, pa Paul, I think we're going to follow up on your presentation a little bit and talk about that challenge of an industry that has traditionally been dominated by mechanical engineers and and uh, petroleum engineers and introducing them to the world of technology because you know they've done some amazing things to be able to know what's happening 8,000 feet below the surface but it but my understanding is they've been a little slower to, to take advantage of digital tools, digitalization. Uh, can you talk about that journey at Ocker BP? Yeah, so for me, there, there's two elements here. Uh, first and foremost, I was talking a bit about the silos uh, of the data. Um, so by not having the possibility to look at the data across several systems, you will, will, you will of course, have problems in looking at the big, bigger picture, finding the whole and complete solution. And secondly, I believe that there's, there's a number of different personas out there. Uh, you, you say traditional mechanical engineers, um, process engineers, you, you would find a whole spectrum. I, I believe that out of Eureka, our digital lab, we have mechanical engineers that have become data scientists with, within a small year, but you would also have, a, have the, you would also have the uh, people that would challenge with, uh, have a challenge with this, this data-driven decision-making with, with the low latency and time series that we expect within Eureka. And Ken, you've been on the other side of this, right? I mean, you're, you're a veteran of this industry, and, and you're, trying to, you're trying to get your team to take advantage. Seen, I've seen it all, Chris, and I'll just, I'll just uh, pile on a little bit to, to, to Paul's comment with a little bit maybe a different dimension. I mean, we, this industry has been through a lot through the 80s. Uh, I lived through that and some of what we're going through right now, which, of course, is post-2014. Um, there's some parallels in that, you know, we clearly have a big focus, as you, open, as you said in your opening comments, to focus on margins and profitability. Um, the point I was really driving to is, you know, if you look at the demographics as to what's happened in this industry in the last, over the last 30 years, I call it the barbell. We have a barbell in the sense that a lot of our professionals are on one end of the barbell or the other in terms of the age demographic. Um, so I'd say, I, needless to say, everybody knows what end of the barbell I'm on. Um, the 45% of our workforce is uh, five years or less in terms of industry experience. Um, that segment of our workforce um, is much more uh, open-minded, a little bit, I use the term digital savvy, um, fun to work with, um, and definitely a little more desirous. Um, um, I tend to be an evangelist of sort of what we're doing, uh, but it de definitely doesn't play as well to the older end of the barbell. 
And, and Gear, with your with your company, I mean, these are these are your customers, right? Uh, what is your perspective on the uptake, uh, the actual uptake, and, and the potential? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of uh, proof of concepts, um, but when it comes to actually you know, putting things into production, operationalizing it, and actually realizing this value, I think uh, we see very little of that happening. And I think you know, that's one of the reasons why AcreBP and Spark Cognition gets this prize, uh, because it's actually, there aren't that many examples of this actually being put into production. So, so we see some, um, some barriers to you know, actually operationalizing and scaling this, um, this you know, put, reaching the potential. And, and that's you know, removing those barriers is, is really what Cognite is about. We, we deal with the kind of data quality issues and the not so sexy things. And then you, you come, you know, companies like Spark Ignition can put, uh, you know, the AI on top of that with a better data foundation and, and move to value faster. I have to say, and, sexy and is would, not a term I hear to use to describe oil and gas, period, <laughs> let alone... But, but I, want to, I want to follow up on, on Gail on that one, and also, Ken, uh, I think um, there's, there's good perspective there, but there's also key elements. You have, you have Cognite, who, who does the data. You have Spark Cognition, who is, uh, who is doing the machine learning, the AI. But you, don't, you need to have the domain expertise. You need to really understand the safety part. And that's, that's where we as operator, we need to dare use the data, and we need to, but we need to safeguard our, our safety. And, and I think Cognite is doing a great job with the data quality, uh, but uh, together with our partners and together with the whole ecosystem, we need to define the safety boundaries so, so that we get that element in. And, and that's critical. It's absolutely critical because you know, the oil and gas industry is a huge value industry. Like, you take one drill ship, a drill ship costs you around $400,000 a day. One of the fields we are together with Acker BP produces 60,000 barrels per day. So that's $1.3 billion of revenue a year. You don't take chances on that very easily. So yes, there has been slow pace of change, but there are reasons for that as well, because you're dealing with very high value assets. So implementation is more right now on the advisory phase where you're looking to augment the work that the technical people are doing rather than replace them altogether. Well, Yash, let me follow up on that because you're the money man. I mean, you're the private <laughs> equity. I mean, they're not, they're not drilling these wells if you're not, if, you're not fi if someone's not financing them, right? They, the money's got to come from someplace. You know, how, what is your perspective? Because I know I get 100 emails a week touting AI this, machine learning that. I mean, what is... When, 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 you're, when a company that's inside your portfolio is looking to make an investment in this kind of technology, what is your standard for whether or not to adopt it? So, uh, it's a good question. And you know, we, we don't pretend to be AI experts. So we're proud to be an investor in Spark Cognition. We just joined, joined them recently. Uh, but we don't pretend to be AI experts. So we don't understand really what's happening uh, under the hood. But what we are, are we are users. We've got 10 plus portfolio companies. We've got so many geologists underneath them. We've got a whole host of petroleum engineers. Within Kerogen, we have our own technical people as well. So whenever we look at any application or technology, we look at it from a very user perspective. How can we implement this? Does it add value? Is it one of the also RANs? How easy is it to implement? And by when can we extract value out of it? So it's a very user-based experience. How can we implement it? That's how we go about it. Yeah, I'd, I'd just pile on a little bit to that, too, in the sense that in, at Hunt, we, we have a, a venture company, a, a company that actually uh, is a corporate, corporate venture capital company. I'm, I'm often asked uh, by the owners of the company for an opinion on whether a pr prospective investor, uh, a pr prospective investment is something I would chime in on. And I, I time and time again say, well, my perspective is really going to be as a potential user. I can't really opine. I'm not, I'm not deep enough in the AI world myself to be able to opine as to whether or not that's a sensible investment or not. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing that we do is that, you know, we're small and flexible. So we can do pilot projects quite quickly. So we can take a particular product, do a pilot on it, and very quickly decide 
does it really work, does it make a difference or not. And Paul, that's, that's what you're talking about with that two-week sprint, is, is y'all are trying to do the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. and that, that's, the, that's the key learning by, by partnering up with Cognite. When you have that data, you, you, get, you are able to get so quickly to the, to the results. Uh, so it's more, it's more about having the right quality, the right tool set to, to trust these, uh, these values. Um, and, uh, and getting also getting that result, you get you are able to get the feedback from the end user, so you can you have that agility to, to try and test. Because time and time again, as as operators uh, work in traditional, where you specify your products and you set uh, strict boundaries both on the use case you are trying to develop and the uh, the type of solution you want to make, then then you fail. But if you have an, a flexibility around around the solution you are able to make, uh, develop, and and in tight collaboration with your customer, I, I'm sure you're much more set up for success. So I imagine a lot of our audience, or I, I, I bet almost no one in our audience has actually been on an offshore rig and seen what, I mean, these are small towns, often with anywhere from a few dozen for, a f okay, all right, there you go, a, f a few dozen to, to, uh, to maybe a, as a, to hundreds of workers, incredibly complex equipment. Can, Paul, can you expand a little bit on the, uh, what kind of assets are out there? I and mean, when we say assets, what, what are the machines that we're talking about that you're, that you're developing tools to monitor? You talked about yeah, I think I think if you if you look into that picture again, we we have been good. Uh, we have had good techniques on, on condition monitoring and machines on, on a quite a long time, uh, but that has been a silo system. Uh, now with the possibility uh, of using data smarter, you are able to see see correlation between systems, and and that's when you find correlations that nobody ever thought about, and that's when you when when you find are able to find a sweet spot that people have not thought about. Uh, but again, you need the right data and the right models to capture those failures. And if you have that, then you are able to, uh, to, to solve big business uh, possibilities in, in, uh, instead of just looking into smaller portions of them. So Gary, you're, you're the data guy. Uh, we have all these different uh, equipment <coughs> manufacturers, all different kinds of data. Um, in the oil business, you know, you'll have as many as maybe 50 subcontractors operating on a project. What are the challenges for you to be able to get that data, to liberate that data, as Paul would say? Oh. <coughs> Where to start? I mean, it's uh, such a jungle, and fortunately, um, industry is moving towards uh, some degree of standardization with, say, OPC, UA, uh, uh, for more modern equipment. But getting at the data is a challenge. Sometimes you have to go out there. So I, I was actually lucky enough to go out to one of these assets, Valhall, which uh, is a kind of city in the ocean. Incredible structure and uh, just amazing experience. Um, so you got to interface with the equipment, but then the equipment data that you get from the equipment is only a uh, tiny bit of, of the total of data, because you have data in these ERP systems, you have engineering systems, 3D models, you have seismic data. And to get the full picture, you have to interface with hundreds of different systems. And then when you have all the data in one place, it's often called the data lake, it's still not enough that you can kind of make sense of it, because it's still, you cannot run queries across these different uh, data boundaries still. Um, so you need to transform the data into a common data model that's independent of the source system. And then you can start to look at all the data in connection. And then you kind of get the, the full big picture. And that, that linking of data, which is what we call uh, contextualization, kind of connecting the data uh, from different systems, that is actually the hardest part for us when it comes to, to dealing with this data. So different systems use different names for the same thing, et cetera. And uh, that's a real challenging problem. Ken, let me ask you, as an operator, how are you, what are the tools that you're actually using? What are the tools that you're most excited about right now that are helping you extract value uh, sure. from the investment? So let me first make a plug for Spark Ignition, why I'm here. Um, hoping uh, a POC we're running with, with, with Spark Ignition today um, 
in an LNG plant that we, we operate in, in Peru uh, leads to bigger and better things. Um, so while it's a POC, uh, I have great hopes uh, that uh, we have the ability to unleash machine learning, um, artificial intelligence in a, in a very sophisticated plant with 100,000 horsepower uh, running compressors and lots of moving parts that ultimately bring that plant to um, higher profitability through just more reliability and obviously all more, more throughput. So that's a POC. What I want to make a plug for As Spark. a proof of concept for those. As a proof of concept. I'm, I'm sorry. It took a minute, a minute for me to catch on. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, beyond that, uh, I've, I've had functional responsibility for our drilling organization, so I've had the ability to say drilling. We're going to uh, we're going to work with machine learning to develop algorithms to get better at drilling. Um, we uh, we have an active program in the Permian Basin. It's a perfect testing ground for it, given it's proximal to our Dallas office. It's easy to get to. Um, so we uh, we've worked with a, a partner to uh, to deploy uh, a, a product which uh, was actually. Uh, uh, modified from the uh, trading world, um, high-frequency algorithmic trading world, developed a drilling uh, accelerator on it, and we're using it to do high computational, high-frequency computational analysis of the streaming data coming in. And we've got models for torque and drag that may not make a lot of sense to a lot of folks here, but uh, also Bitware. Bitware is Clearly, if, if bit wears out during it, when you're just about to the end of the hole and you've got to pull it, that's a very expensive operation because you've actually got to extract, extract the drilling assembly from the hole, go back in and drill the last part of it. So if we can get smarter about adjusting drilling parameters to have the bit last longer and be able to drill that last 10% without a bit without uh, running into extreme bit wear, then that, that's great. So those are examples. Uh, uh, the, the plant, obviously, uh, I want to see it run in the completion space, which is you know, the, the after effect of drilling as well. We're going to, we're going to, we're beginning to bring our data in from our completion operations, uh, where we spend the bulk of our capital today, at least in, in the domestic world, most of the capital is being spent on completions, not drilling. And so there's a high value proposition to getting smarter about making real time decisions during the, the process of fracking a well. Yash, um, as an investor, this is what you want to see, right? I mean, you want to know that the companies, that the operators, the C-suites of the, of, of the companies you invest in, that they're, using, that they're using data to protect their assets and they're using data to maximize revenue. Is that right? Can that's, look, that's, that's absolutely right. And, but I think, you know, as we've discussed, we are at the early days yet. So as an investor, we also take it upon ourselves to drive that change. Right. We got into looking at digitalization around a couple of years back as far as AI, ML is concerned. And when we first went and spoke to our engineers and our geologists, they said, ah, digital oil field. I worked on that in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, no, 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 this is different, right? So you've got to look at this seriously. Uh, one example of you know, how we drive changes, uh, and this is from Norway. Uh, Norway is a great place to get data. You know, the, it, a lot of government data is available. But data in the oil and gas business is so messy. It exists in so many different file types, PDF files, scribbles, Excel files, all kinds of different formats. So we started a data ingestion project to help our company over there uh, to ingest all the Norwegian public data on all different formats, different, um, you know, all different places. And uh, we recently did our first pilot based on that uh, data ingestion, and it involved machine learning to categorize and appropriately identify the data. And in the recent bidding round, Pandian, you know, earlier they used to take, uh, an engineer could look at two wells in two days. In the last round, we could do two days, 100 wells. So that's a huge leg up. Um, and we hope to be able to replicate this, you know, going from Norway, go to UK, and absorb other national databases as well. And machine learning and AI has a huge role to play in that. So we've got about five and a half minutes left. Um, I'd like to hear from the panelists, you know, what, 
in the medium term, not the long term, but in the medium term, next three to five years, what is the, what is the big challenge that AI can help solve in the oil and gas industry? What, what would your like, dream product be that's, that, that you can, you've got enough that you can, that it's a reasonable expectation, but you're not there yet? So, yeah, Ken? I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that, and it's probably not going to be, I'll use that term sexy again, it's not going to be as sexy and far out there as, because uh, I think even in the next three years, we're still in a lot of blocking and tackling. Um, I go to uh, Eric's point here about data. Um, we have mountains of data. We have off-site storage with paper records and tape records that are sitting collecting dust and um, need to be harvested. We need to, we need to gather it together, um, make sense of it, and, and think about what value can be extracted from, from the data we already have and the copious data we continue to consume and ingest every day. Um, so um, I think it's getting our house in order having to do with, with, with data such that we can virtualize it, democratize it to the entire workforce so we can get away from silo, from, from being high centered on particular software to examine particular data so that we can, we can, we can, we can become agnostic as to what, what tools we use to uh, interrogate it. Garrett, can you do that? I think, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope we'll be able to do that. Um, I think to me though, uh, what I dream about is this, um, you know, this, this thing called an OODA loop, this observe, orient, decide and act. And most use cases are actually this loop, but it's not closed. It's like you, you use sensor to observe something and then you kind of take those observations and you put them into context with kind of existing data, you do the contextualization, which is actually the orient phase. Then you decide, you, you have your algorithm, your uh, machine learning or whatever, it decides on some action. And today at best, that's an advisory thing. Uh, and a human goes in and pushes the button. And I think, you know, in the medium long term, we'll have that fully automated. And that will be uh, pretty sweet. Yash, what do you think about that? Um, so if I look three to five years, is it possible or not? But the ultimate end game is we're now looking at predictive maintenance, and that's really important for offshore platforms, for example. Then we want to move to production management. And then finally, we want to move to reservoir management. Can all three of these steps be achieved in the next three to five years? Maybe, but probably not. It's a long hurdle. So a short-term goal is to just make sure that at least on predictive maintenance, there's greater adoption within the organization. It's very easy to get the POC, get a pilot project done, but then our organizations have got so much bureaucracy. It's so hard to push things through the IT department on one side and the operations technology department on the one side and the CEO's office on the third side. It's just quite messy. So greater adoption universally of data and technology is the first goal. Paul, that sounds like your world. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would just like to follow up because I think the, the learning loop Gail uh, explained here, that, that's, the, that's the end goal and, and whether what type of technique you use uh, to, to do, your, you do your decision, uh, that has to be supported by the data and the model. Um, but in terms of IE, uh, just by the model I presented, we have uh, we have a line of sight, and now uh, we we started up having a three hourly updates on the models. Uh, we cut it down to 90 minutes, and now we have it on 20 minutes, and then we have a line of sight on three minutes, and uh, and that just shows the exponential growth and the, the ability you are able to to learn and how to improve the models when you use it. Also. Um, getting the right amount of good data and bad data in when you start using the models is, is, is a very good experience. So for me, it's about matching uh, the business challenge with, with data and, and model and not locking ourselves into one solution. Well, I have to say, in, in Houston, when I meet with energy company CEOs, the one thing that they always talk about is 
the need for people with these skills. This is the number one challenge for the oil and gas industry. And, and maybe some of the mid-level managers haven't figured that out, but certainly the, um, the C-suites have the people with vision for the future of these companies. Uh, they know that this is the future, and they are desperately looking for people like, the, uh, like these gentlemen on the stage. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking them. <laughs>